Thank you, Secretary McHugh. John was sworn in as Secretary of the Army last month, and I speak for the entire Department of Defense in saying we're glad to have him on board. For a decade and a half, he represented the district that includes Fort Drum. His support made that installation one of the Army's best. Through his work on the House Armed Services Committee, including as ranking member, he has been a forceful champion for all soldiers. And I know he will continue his advocacy on their behalf. Secretary McHugh, thank you once again for taking on this responsibility, although I will tell you I leaned over to him during the opening ceremony and said, beats the hell out of a committee hearing, doesn't it? <laughs> And of course, my warmest thanks to AUSA for the invitation to attend your annual meeting. It's a real honor to speak at the opening of this conference with its focus on NCOs, the steel spine of the Army. My first encounter with NCOs came back in January 1967 when I was a brand new second lieutenant in the Air Force. It took me all of about a day and a half before I figured out who it was that really made the military run, or at least made we junior officers run, the non-commissioned officers. So I did what my sergeant suggested, and the two of us did my job pretty well. <laughs> Every morning, one of the first people I see when I walk in my office is an Army NCO. And as you might expect, he's almost always there when I leave as well. Sergeant Jason Eason, an E-5 who has been on two, two tours in Iraq, is here with us today. Jason, welcome, and thanks for your service. As Secretary of Defense, I pay every bit as much attention to what NCOs say now as I did when I was a very green second lieutenant. I always make it a point to meet with and listen to NCOs around the country and in the theater where they're serving with such honor and distinction. Last month, I had the opportunity to attend the Medal of Honor ceremony for Army First Cl Sergeant First Class Jared Monty, the second Army NCO to receive the Medal of Honor during the recent conflicts. His is a story of true valor, and there are so many others. And in fact, it's hard to believe that only six medals of honor have been bestowed since 2001, all posthumously. With all that our nation has asked of the Army in recent years, and all that troops like Sergeant Monty have given, it is important for our soldiers to know that they have such a strong advocate in this organization. For more than half a century, AUSA chapters across the country and the headquarters here have aided the troops and their families at home, and especially relevant today when our soldiers are deployed. This takes many forms, from care packages to family support conferences to scholarship donations, all unified by a single purpose, giving our soldiers and their families the support they have earned. I spoke to this gathering in 2007 less than a year after I became Secretary of Defense. There's an old saying about the one-year mark in Washington. For the first six months, you wonder how the hell you got here. For the next six months, you wonder how the hell the rest of them got here. <laughs> and I might add that after nearly three years, you start wondering how the hell you're still here. <laughs> Much has happened since I last spoke with you from the changing nature of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan to the economic crisis facing our country. And of course, we have a new commander-in-chief. And I can tell you that President Obama is committed to making sure to the well-being of every soldier and to making sure they have the tools to do their job. And the First Lady has made it a personal priority to support and champion our military families. If you had asked me in October 2007 if I would still be addressing this forum two years later, still as Secretary of Defense, I would have told you you were crazy. But when President Obama asked me to stay on, 
I thought about all the troops we have in combat who are serving their country far from home and often under fire. I thought especially about the soldiers who have borne the brunt of the wars with repeated and lengthy tours and who continue to re-enlist and redeploy with a great sense of purpose in their mission and a great sense of pride in their country. I thought about their sacrifices and the sacrifices of their families. I thought about all those things and knew that I could only say yes to the new president. Our troops are all doing their duty, and I had to do mine. And having the chance to serve with them is the greatest and most humbling experience and honor of my life. Today I want to talk about the Army, the current challenges we face, what the Department of Defense is doing for our soldiers right now, and what it needs to do in the future. And finally, some thoughts about where the service needs to go in the years ahead. First, however, a few words about the campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan. As you know, in June, the U.S. mission in Iraq underwent a sea change as we turned security and urban areas over to the Iraqis. That was a significant step as we dramatically reduce our presence earlier ne early next year following elections and continue to shift to a purely advise and assist mission. General Odierno said last week that violence is down 85 percent over the past two years, an accomplishment made possible by the hard work and sacrifices of many thousands of soldiers. At the same time, Afghanistan has been on a different and worrisome trajectory, with violence levels up some 60 percent from last year. I believe the decisions that the President will make for the next stage of the Afghanistan campaign will be among the most important of his presidency. So it is important that we take our time to do all we can to get this right. And in this process, it is imperative that all of us taking part in these deliberations civilians and military alike, provide our best advice to the President candidly but privately. And speaking for the Department of Defense, once the Commander-in-Chief makes his decisions, we will salute and execute those decisions faithfully and to the best of our ability. Even as we consider the future, I am prepared to respond to urgent needs and will keep pushing to get the troops the equipment they need IEDs remain the number one cause of casualties in Afghanistan. And let there be no doubt that as long as our troops are in harm's way, the Department of Defense will do everything it can to destroy these IED networks and protect those heroes in the fight. To accomplish this, I have ordered additional intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities to Afghanistan, including the most advanced drones and new platforms such as the MC-12. Thousands of enablers, including additional EOD teams, are en route. And the first MRAPs, designed specifically for Afghanistan's rugged terrain, the MATVs, were delivered to theater last week, only three months after the initial contracts were awarded. And in the next year, we will field thousands of these life-saving vehicles. Our nation is understandably weary after six years in Iraq and eight years in Afghanistan. Of course, the challenges America faces in these campaigns are reflected back here in the demands placed on an army under strain. Easing that strain and getting the troops what they need drove many of the changes reflected in the fiscal year 2010 budget. The broad goal was to improve and institutionalize support for troops and their families, rebalance the department to address a wider range of threats, and correspondingly reform how and what we buy. Let me start with some of the programs we have to support families. We all know the old saying that you recruit the soldier, but you re-enlist the family. The base budget we submitted earlier this year includes $9 billion for family support, child care, spousal services, and housing, among others. Perhaps more important, we shifted funds from supplemental war bills to the base budget, 
to ensure that these family programs won't go away when the wars do.